chairman, fellow Akaras, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The first thing I did when I received the invitation to speak at this event was to download plagiarism checking software. <laughs> I thought it wise in today's copyright conscious world. Unfortunately, when I ran my presentation through it, all it told me was that no matter what idea you come up with, someone, somewhere, has thought of it before you. <laughs> so I have decided to protect myself against all charges of copyright infringement by stating from the outset that I am not sure which of the ideas I'll be, I'll be presenting are my own. I bet you didn't know that in today's world, the average individual is exposed to 34 gigabytes of data each day from various sources. And so I hope you would forgive me if I'm no longer too certain which ideas are mine and which I have borrowed. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, let me say that it's a privilege to share the stage with people whom I hold in such high esteem. And I wish to thank the organizers for placing me in such sterling company. I'm actually reassured by the lineup of panelists, because indeed we have a very weighty matter to consider. What role will industry, business, and entrepreneurship play in shaping the Ghana of 2030? A very perplexing issue when you consider the fate of just one subsector of our economy selected for your consideration, because it is an amalgam of the characteristics of industry, business, commerce, and entrepreneurship, and I refer here to the textile industry. At its zenith, the textile subsector dominated the manufacturing sector in Ghana. In 1970, the 16 textile manufacturers employed 25,000 Ghanaians. Today, 50-something years on, there are only four players left in the industry and they currently employ a mere 2,900 Ghanaians. In 2011, the ratio of imported textiles to exported textiles in Ghana stood at 125%, or we imported 25% more textiles than we exported. By 2015, the excess of imported textiles over exported stood at a staggering 827%. The only conclusion is that from where we stand today, textile manufacturing will not be making any further meaningful contribution to the nation's development. This is the sad state of affairs of a sector that once had the potential to catalyze the development of a very powerful supply network linking cotton farming to ginning, yarning, and spinning, and connecting to dye manufacturing, and then linking forward to artisanal seamstresses and tailors and industrial clothing makers, the gravity of where this sector finds itself today should not be underestimated. Because when we promote the wearing of made in Ghana clothing, we could unwittingly be driving the demand for imported fabric of dubious legitimacy. Mr. Chairman, is the case of the Ghanaian textile subsector indicative of what the future holds for other sectors of our economy? Can we accurately predict what changes will define the world in which Ghana finds, would find itself a few years from now? This is a challenging undertaking. History is full of examples of failures at predicting the shape and form of our world. We are told that in the early 1900s, an internal Western Union memo stated, and I quote, this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherent, inherently of no value to us." End of quote. How wrong they were. In our own times, on the day before the Brexit referendum, 75% of all bets placed with Ladbrokes, the UK bookmakers, were odds-on for a vote to remain in the EU. And of course, all the pundits were wrong about who was going to be the 45th president of the United States. 
The polls had him failing at the primaries and certainly losing in the main election. Apparently, only Nostradamus, who seems to have foreseen every major event of our times, and The Simpsons, allegedly in an episode in March 2000, accurately identified the rise of the Trump. Mr. Chairman, unfortunately, the difficulty in predicting what lies ahead does not excuse any serious entity from the responsibility of trying to anticipate its future. It is only with a clear understanding of the future, as envisioned from a current position, that one can begin to contrive a strategy that will lead to a predetermined, unique, and desirable position in that future. Someone once described the future as a blank sheet of paper whose surface gets inscribed on with a story of outcomes, depending on the actions taken and the decisions made today. This feedforward link between today and tomorrow is always on, and therefore, what the year 2030 will hold for Ghana will depend on our acts of commission or omission, our decisions or our indecision, our action or our inaction, our thoughtfulness or thoughtlessness, our carefulness or our carelessness, our priorities and our choices. Mr. Chairman, where Ghana would be in 2030 and what contribution industry, business and entrepreneurs will make to getting to that goal will be critically dependent on where we, the nation, plan to be in 2030 and what we do between now and then. This we must do in order that we do not give truth to the words of the Osibisa hit. We are going. Heaven knows where we are going. We will know we are there. We will get there. Heaven knows how we will get there. We know we will. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Osibisa give us the reason why it is worth our while to project forward to the year 2030 and hopefully chart a course which will not only get us there, but will also ensure that as a nation, Ghana is relevant, desirable, prosperous, civilized, respected, and strong. It is our responsibility to deliver on this vision. The Ghana we aspire to create, no, the Ghana which it's our duty to deliver, belongs to our children and their children. Our generation must take action today that will ensure that our nation stands ready to once again lead the continent in actualizing the, in my opinion, hackneyed Africa rising storyline. There is a phrase that I much rather prefer as a descriptor for the unique attributes of our dear nation. And I'm going to quote from a book, and nobody should accuse me of bootlicking. I came across this quotation in a book authored by Accra Ken Furiata, entitled Leadership, Entrepreneurship, and Values. I had never heard the potential renaissance of Africa described so aptly. In a speech delivered at the Chatham, Chatham House, Accra Ufuriata quotes Gaius Plinius Secundus, also known as Pliny the Elder, a Roman historian and one-time procurator of the African province of the Roman Empire, who said, and I quote, ex Africa, semper aliquid novi, end of quote. In English, for the younger ones in our midst, out of Africa, always something new. I'm sure you'll all agree that Africa is indeed the unique place of discovery, amazement, creativity, and the unexpected, both good and bad, that this phrase implies. Mr. Chairman, before I attempt to leap forward in time to explore our future, permit me to make some assumptions. The first is that I hope that we are all agreed that the Ghana of 2030 is the one I described earlier on, relevant, desirable, prosperous, civilized, respected, and strong. Secondly, let's assume that the needs of industry, commerce, agriculture, services, and all productive units of the economy are, at a macro level, the same or similar, and are driven by the same factors and subject to similar stresses. 
Finally, grant me that every business, big or small, has entrepreneurial roots, and all, business, all businesses understand the importance of maintaining an entrepreneurial streak, no matter how far they may currently be from their entrepreneurial origins. I begin by dwelling a little on the Ghana of today, with maybe a small backward glance at how we evolved into this nation. Indeed, should we fail to adequately appreciate where we are both in absolute and relative terms, we could remain a directionless and culturally bereft people who, as Arundhati Roy in her book, The God of Small Things, put it, and I quote, are pointed in the wrong direction, trapped outside their own history, and unable to retrace their steps because their footprints have been swept away, end of quotation. Let's start by summarizing our recent planning history as a nation. As required by the 1992 Constitution, we had Vision 2020, a creatively coined moniker with its nod to perfect visual acuity, suggesting that we had accurately foreseen what the year 2020 would be. Vision 2020 spanned 1996 to 2000. Then came two versions of GPRS, the Ghana Poverty Reduction Strategy and the Growth and Poverty Reduction Strategy, running from 2001 to 2009. And then two varieties of the just-ended Ghana Shared Growth and Development Agenda, GSGDA, which ends this year. From 2018 onwards, our development will be driven by the long-term National Development Plan covering the next 40 years from 2018 to 2057. Again, our planners have cleverly built rhyme and reason into the state detail of planning. 2057 would mark 100 years of our nation's existence, and this plan will cover the 10 election cycles between its com commencement and our centennial. Unsurprisingly, all these plans and frameworks say similar things about our development priorities, and indeed much of what they say are the right things. Interestingly, when one looks even further back, one sees that the language of our development plans has not changed much in a hundred years. The Gordon Gadgetsburg Development Plan of the 1910s and the Burns Plan of the 1950s both focus on infrastructure development, the expansion and diversification of agriculture, development of social service delivery systems with special emphasis on schools and hospitals, development of the economic and productive sectors, investment in communication and transportation infrastructure. Let's jump a few years forward to the famous seven-year development plan, also known as work and happiness, a rather idyllic association of two words that rarely ap appreciate each other's company. This plan repeats much of the same emphasis, but this time places government at the center of massive capital investment in industrialization, with all other factors supporting the newly spawned industries. The more contemporary plans continue many of these themes, with the main differences being in the emphasis on, say, poverty reduction, growth, economic stability, or promotion of the private sector. I am sure, like me, you are wondering if we have really moved forward, if we are still repeating the same prescriptions first articulated over a hundred years ago. So where have all these plans left us as we approach the key 2020 milestone? Firstly, we are now officially a middle-income country. No applause. That was the central goal, that was the central goal of the Vision 2020. So on the one hand, we have made it. And we got there actually in 2011, nine clear years before the 2020 finishing line. The reality is slightly more nuanced than this. As members of the polity of middle-income nations, we rub shoulders with the likes of Botswana, China, Malaysia, India, and Indonesia. However, when we are correctly placed in our peer group of lower middle income countries, then we are classmates with, amongst others, Bhutan, Tonga, 
Vanuatu, and the West Bank, Gaza. It becomes evident that the categorization really doesn't mean much, especially when you consider the day-to-day -day reality that ordinary Ghanaians, businessmen, entrepreneurs, industrialists, and the many engaged in commerce face in Ghana today. An IFC Enterprise Survey released in 2013 profiled the ease or otherwise of doing business in Ghana against countries in our income group, the lower middle income group, as well as against those in a broader sub-Saharan Africa group. Although this data is slightly dated, it serves the purpose since at least it is post the 2011 middle income announcement. I can see people's eyes glazing over for fear that I'm about to go on and on about statistics. I assure you that I put in extra effort to make this, sec this section interesting and brief. Of the businesses surveyed, majority of them, in actual fact, 73% had been in existence for 20 years or less. 80% were established with private domestic capital, whilst 20% were the product of private foreign investment. These firms were asked to identify the key factors that shaped the business environment and which either enhanced or constrained their performance. Ladies and gentlemen, the results were sadly unsurprising. In answer to questions about what, in their view, constituted the main hindrance to their business, 48% of the firms surveyed pointed at access to finance as the number one challenge that they faced in Ghana. 18% said it was poor infrastructure, including the unreliable provision of electricity, water, telecoms, and other utilities. 7% mentioned access to land. Another 7% held the view that customs and trade regulations were their main problem, while 6% mentioned high taxation and onerous tax systems. Finally, 6% mentioned corruption as the main obstacle to doing business in Ghana. Distinguished guests, permit me to drill down into just a couple of the issues raised to give more color to this picture. For example, on infrastructure, firms reported an average of nine power outages in a typical month. Nine power outages in a typical month. Compare this to an average of seven across the sub-Saharan Africa group and 4.5 for the other lower middle income comparators. And they estimated the, lost, the value loss due to these power outages to be as much as 12% of sales. In other words, power outages had imposed a 12% tax on these businesses, on their gross sales. For the sub-Saharan African group, the estimated loss due to power outages was only 4%, and for the other lower middle income countries, it was as low as 2%. The firm surveyed reported that it took 43 days to obtain an electrical connection, 58 days to be hooked to the water supply system, and there was no data available for how long it took to secure a mainline telephone connection. I think we all know why. It is near impossible. In the area of regulation burden, Ghanaian firms reported that it took 90 days to secure a construction permit. 35% of our firms reported that they were expected to make an informal payment. It's a bribe. To secure government contracts. And between 20% and 30% said they expected to do the same to secure construction permits, get an import license, or land an operating permit. This particularly worrying finding was summarized in something called a graft index. Let us see how our dear nation fared. The lower middle income group average on the graft index was 15%. Ghana scored 30% double what our LMI peers scored. A sobering statistic indeed. Now, the area that was seen by all firms as the greatest impediments 
to business growth was access to finance. I have now stepped onto thin ice. The entire panel is made up of gurus of the Ghana's financial system. 76% of Ghanaian firms relied on internal funds for investment. I wonder if this is the proof of the old wife's tale that banks only lend to those who do not really need it. Interestingly, Ghana scored the highest, 95%, when it came to firms with bank accounts. So basically, almost all Ghanaian firms operated bank accounts, but we benefited the least from bank loans. The figures for equity funding are harrowing. Only a paltry 4.7% sold shares in their business to raise growth capital. Finally, of the respondents who were able to secure bank funding, Ghanaian financial institutions demanded the highest level of collateralization. On average, Ghanaian firms needed to provide collateral that had a value of at least 240% of the loan amount, i.e. over twice the value of the loan. The average for Sub-Saharan Africa was 175%, and for the low to middle income group, 190%. Oh, and did I mention the small issue of Ghana's being amongst the highest cost of borrowing on the continent? Why should this situation exist in a country where it is estimated that the private pension system holds almost 8 billion Ghana CDs in assets under management? But this is the reality of the business environment in our lower middle income country. On top of these, there are numerous less quantitative challenges that businesses face in Ghana. From issues relating to skills and attitudes of the workforce to our stiff-necked disregard for punctuality. And I'm glad this program does not fall into this category. The general environment in which we seek to situate world-class businesses is contradictory to that objective. In attempting to draw attention to some of these contextual issues, I said in a presentation I made last week that we are at risk of getting overwhelmed by the growing tyranny of Okada riders in our streets, the pall from burning rubbish that hangs over our cities, the terrifying traffic and time-consuming commutes that we undertake daily. Not surprising when you think that road accounts for 97% of passenger and freight movement in Ghana. The ubiquitous black plastic bags that in gusty conditions may be easily mistaken for birds in graceful flight. The but for the grace of God medical facilities that we are rushed to in emergencies the decadent importation of essential non-essentials, such as soap, rice, canned drinks, chocolate, fruits, the list goes on. Filth piled up against the walls of palatial residences. Million dollar mansions, which can only be located by reference to the Loto kiosk, the mango tree, and the Kofi Brookman cellar. And then only accessible via untarmacked dusty roads bordered by open drains. The irony of the world's most expensive automobile brands scraping and bumping their way over lunar surface-like tracks, euphemistically labeled as roads, and most of them now have names. Mine is Ni Odoi Fuche Road. <laughs> the entire bus rapid transit system reduced to a snail's pace because four well-built built young men are manhandling a push truck laden with imported tin tomatoes up a hill towards market, Makola Market in the BRT lane. These seemingly small things, scaled up and becoming endemic, make for a very challenging business environment and increases the gradient of our development curve. And yet, business and industry continue to make a contribution to the nation, delivering jobs, contributing taxes, creating wealth, and driving change and innovation. The Ghana Statistical Service informs us that the service sector created nine out of every 10 jobs in 2014. The Ghana Living Standards Survey for the same year estimates that the informal sector, consisting mainly of small to medium enterprises, employs about 88% of the 
of the adult population of Ghana. So do the negatives outweigh the positives? Is all lost? Distinguished guests, let me invite us to change our perspective and view our environment through the entrepreneur's lens. The entrepreneur has a finely tuned nose to sniff out business opportunities where you and I only see problems. The famous anecdote about two shoe salesmen who were sent to a country where no one wore shoes depicts the difference in perspective. One of the salesmen sent a telex back to headquarters saying, no one wears shoes here, absolutely no market for our product. The other said, no one wearing shoes here, huge untapped potential market. By focusing on the needs of society, entrepreneurs create new businesses or introduce innovations that solve problems. And there's such a large and pressing need in our, in our country for so many things. Social, economic, infrastructural, technological, you name it, we probably need it. So to an entrepreneur, and Ghana and indeed Africa must look like the mythical El Dorado. The IFC report referred to earlier indicated that 70% of businesses in Ghana required imported inputs. Imagine, this represents a huge area for potential exploitation through the aggressive substitution of imports with local raw materials. The good thing about entrepreneurs is that their attitude to risk is such that they require very little encouragement to take the first step. They have the attitude that they will proceed and succeed in spite of, not because of. Whether governments do anything or not, entrepreneurs will always find a way to rise. Therefore, would it not be a wise government that moves from enjoying the unanticipated benefit of entrepreneurial activity to one that stimulates, nurtures, and unleashes the full force of these powerful agents of progress? Would it not be a very wise nation that unhitched the prosperity of entrepreneurs from the political locomotive? Would it not be a progressive nation that built on the strong entrepreneurial spirit of the Ghanaian, stretching back to the time of Jacob Wilson C., a founder of the Ab Aborigines' Right Protection Society, who in 1876 was reputed to have been a millionaire in British pound terms? So this leads me nicely to a now chronic pet peeve of mine. And I'm hoping that given that Akora is moving into the big office at the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, we will see some change. Why, for the love of all that is holy, do we not place the same emphasis and recognition on local investment as we do on foreign investment? A local company will invest and reinvest for almost its entire existence. And no matter how much it invests or how long it continues to reinvest for or how much it grows, the best it can hope for is an aggressive tax audit and maybe a plaque for their troubles. A foreign investor waltzes into Ghana and is welcomed with tax holidays, expatriate quotas, unfettered rep repatriation of profits, and expedited port processes. Yes. We can use FDI in certain sectors where we lag the world. But even then, wouldn't it be more beneficial if we aggressively encourage meaningful local participation in the ownership and wealth creation of these incoming entities? In the Emirates, I am told it's against the law for a foreigner to own more than 49% of a locally incorporated company. Surely, we should have the self-confidence as a nation to insist on something similar. Anyhow, as Ghanaians aspire to better at all levels and demand solutions to our numerous challenges, the opportunities to profit from bold, boundaryless, and creative thinking become increasingly available and attractive. Ghana today is uniquely placed to leapfrog our peers and experience a times 10 multiplier in our development if only we would nurture, incentivize, and reward homegrown economic players to blossom and grow 
into national, regional, and dare I say global giants. A process of selection of strategic areas that would take off, given the right stimulus and support, must be undertaken. This strategic map will identify new, weak, and underserved areas in the national value chain and provide a framework that targets, nurtures, and protects specific players in these verticals to thrive and grow into stars. I know that talk of protection is regarded as blasphemy in the global trade system. But tell me what is wrong with protecting your business from subsidized goods from abroad, from foreigners active in proscribed areas, from dumped surpluses from the buffer stocks of foreign nations, from grain imports, from outright intellectual property theft, from expired goods, from substandard products, and from criminal smuggling. It is the government's duty to protect its players from such red cardable offenses in the trade game. But more importantly, it is the government's job to design and build structures, systems, and strategies to allow the emergence of a cohort of Ghanaian world-beating businesses. So let's look at the story of South Korea. The conglomerates that bootstrapped South Korea out of a post-war poverty-stricken state into the global economic powerhouse it is today in less than 50 years were deliberately and consciously cajoled into dominance by their government. They are called chaebols. The government of General Park Chung-hee actively identified, courted, involved, and promoted specific private sector players. Most of these were existing South Korean companies, some large, but majority SMEs, who had paid their dues, done their time, and had continued to invest in themselves. Having political contacts certainly helped, but if you did not have a real functioning business with some provenance, you did not qualify. For those that qualified, they received government and foreign financial assistance. assistance. Regulations were relaxed to encourage agility and responsiveness, and tax breaks were made available to encourage more aggressive reinvestment. To encourage smaller niche or specialist areas, especially in the high-tech space, the beneficiaries of government support were encouraged to acquire and incubate these often smaller entities. The linkages and shared thinking with the private sector were so strong that the chairman of the Federation of Korean Industries, their equivalent of our AGI, was at one point referred to as the prime minister of the economy. Was this the right thing to do? Well, how many of us in this room have Samsung phones? How many of us drove here in a Hyundai or a Kia vehicle? How many of us have LG appliances at home? So for Ghana, the question remains how we select the areas that will receive enablement attention. The main consideration should be to focus on areas in which we can differentiate ourselves. Areas in which we have genuine, sustainable, and differentiating advantage, and therefore, which with focused investment will catapult us ahead of everyone else. Within each of these identified sectors, government must now target entities for enterprise level support. The Korean story gives us clear tips about what we can do so that industry, business, and entrepreneurs can become the true motive force of our development. For example, we can look at agro-processing and value-enhancing agricultural ventures and set ourselves the goal of building end-to-end -end value chains, value-adding systems, where locally produced tin tomatoes can be traced back to a farm in the northern region, where chili sauces can be traced to the small holdings in the savannah plains of Greater Accra where the chili was grown, mango purees to plantations around the Dodua forest, and organic honey to hives that hang off the rocks on the Kweu escarpment. This is the thinking that should steer the one district, one factory agenda. The entire value chain must be strategically distributed, and the linkages to value-adding nodes must be well thought out. Priority must be given to infrastructure investments which modernize and connect the strategic nodes enabling us to achieve high efficiency. 
Business enablers such as financiers, telcos, and utility providers must be given the wherewithal, the regulatory space, and the incentives to facilitate the growth at each of these nodes. The same thinking can be just as easily applied to the IT sector, where the most important resource is the ingenuity and intellectual horsepower of the human resource. In addition, we can and must encourage, support, and nurture social enterprise, whether it be in waste management, microinsurance for farmers, localized small-scale power generation, or cooperatives of artisanal producers. The success of these will deliver transformation faster than most other means. The process will only work if we can decouple it from the political system so that businesses on the program can obtain the benefits of the concept through uninterrupted support. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the single largest risk to the concept. I will encourage you to read an article written by Accra Kwekuse Chiado in 2008 entitled Picking on Winners. And the clue is in the play on words in the title. We must pick winners and not pick on winners for political reasons. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, ideas are great, but above all else, let us remember that the year 2030 will only be as great as our execution of the great ideas that we generate. Ladies and gentlemen, let us move from talk to action. That is where vision and strategy become the brush strokes of a developmental masterpiece with a magic and genius to transform our nation. On the NDPC website, National Development, Development Planning Commission website, I found a document that gave a summary of the new 40-year plan. In it, there was a payoff line that I suppose was placed there to excite commitment to the plan. It said, dream it, plan it, live it. But there's a glaring omission. There is no do it in there. <laughs> How do we expect to live the plan if we do not execute the plan? and execute it very well. Is it possible that our partial for long talking in Ghana with little or no follow through is the cause of our stunted growth? This series of lectures will only add to the volume of words spoken and written about Ghana if we do not find a way to turn at least some of the ideas into actions. And we do not have to look very far for examples of how to do it. Right here in our midst are many Akaras who didn't just talk, they did. Just consider our panelists for this evening. Akura Okoni Kwejani, the pioneer and godfather of the non-bank financial institution sector, and on whose coattails many entrepreneurs like my boss, Prince Amabing, rode. Akura Karen Akiumitano, who was a part of the entrepreneurial effort that birthed, nurtured, and grew Africa's first truly transnational bank, Ecobank. Akura Kofi Finn, who with his partner, Akura Chris Hammond, founded Petra Trust, which today sits in the top tier of private pension trustees in Ghana. Akura Ken Ufuriata, whose exploits in founding Data Bank and leading the modernization of the investment and capital market industry in Ghana are already the stuff of legend. The indictment on us as a nation is, of, is that of these few examples, the only one that can boast of being a truly con continental player is Ecobank, and it is not Ghanaian. A burgeoning private sector creates jobs, contributes to government revenue, it helps resolve macroeconomic deficiencies, reduces the social burden on government, and enhances the diplomatic stature of the country on the global stage. All that government must do is hold the private sector in a loving embrace and provide the regulatory, legislative, policy, and infrastructure environment, as well as the right incentives to get the Ghanaian entrepreneur to step up to the plate. 
And then governments must strategically pick potential champions and transform them into not only local, but continental and global winners. Ghana must offer to the continent and to the world a new development paradigm, a new model of economic independence. Then taking creative liberty with the words of Pliny the Elder, we can say, ex Ghana, semper aliquid novi. Out of Ghana, always something new. God bless us all. Thank you. <laughs>